Well, hello, hello, all my amazingly beautiful Zodiac family and friends. My name is Libra Empress, and this is another episode of Terror and Tarot with Libra Empress. Today, we are going to be watching Three Unsettling Horror Stories Animated by IMR Scary Tales. Without further ado, let's get started. This is a horrible experience that happened during the 2020 quarantine. I went on a solo trip to Japan and got stuck there amidst the coronavirus outbreak. Luckily, I met a guy on my hiking program and became friends with him. His name was Hiroshi. Hiroshi was born and brought up in Japan. He lived with his parents in a small township of Japan. I was completely helpless as all the flights were postponed declaring a lockdown all around the world. Hiroshi invited me to stay with his family until the airports became active again. I must say, people in Japan are very close to nature. The way their houses were built in villages suffices that they love being in nature. Hiroshi's house was exactly like that. It was a small two-storied wooden house. Hiroshi shared his room with me. His mother made an extra bed on the wooden floor. They were some of the nicest people I have ever met in life. One morning, I was having breakfast with them when Hiroshi's father came home with a sad face. Now, let me tell you that Hiroshi's village is quite far from the urban area, so the effect of the pandemic was mild there. Seeing his father's upset face, Hiroshi asked, What happened, Papa? His father replied in a sad tone, Another suicide has been reported in Aoki Gahara. Local people are saying it was a woman in her late 30s. God knows how many lives will this forest take. I wasn't aware of the topic of this conversation, so I kept staring at them blankly. After breakfast, Hiroshi and I went for a walk around the village. I asked him, What is Aoki Gahara? Hiroshi said, It's a forest nearby our village. People often call it the suicide forest. I had no idea about any of this, so I kept staring at him with a very surprised look. Hiroshi went on saying that local people believe the forest to be a haunted place. In fact, Many people have claimed to see ghosts inside that forest. I asked, How far is the forest? He replied, Not much. It's half an hour hike from our house. We have nothing to do anyway. Also, going out and spending time in the wild will help us to refresh our mind. So I said, Hey, let's go and visit this place. Anyways, we're getting bored by sitting home. Hiroshi said in a worried voice, I don't know. I have to ask my parents first. There are many scary stories about this place. As the sun started to set, we decided to head back home. In the evening, we were sitting in the living room. Hiroshi looked to his parents and mentioned the hiking trip to the suicide forest. Though they denied at first, after our repeated requests, his father finally gave us permission. But he told us to leave the place before dark. I agreed because I anyway had no intention of staying inside a dark forest that has numerous reported cases of suicides. The next morning, Hiroshi and I packed our bags and started our journey. I was in a relaxed mood that finally, after two weeks, we were stepping outside this village. We were almost near the last house in the village. The mountain road went ahead from its left. Thirty minutes walk on that road will lead us to Aoki Gahara. At the doorstep of the last house, we saw an old man sitting on a wooden chair. We were about to walk past him when he stood up and grabbed my hand. I got a bit startled and said, Hey, are you okay? His eyes were gloomy as if he was daydreaming. The wrinkles on his face denoted how extremely old he is. Hiroshi said in a shaken voice, What is it, Pa? The man didn't look at him. Instead, he just stared at me and then said in a feeble voice, Kizuku Kuchisakiona. Kizuku Kuchisakiona. It goes without saying that, I didn't understand his words at all, but Hiroshi's terrified face told me that this old man is saying something scary. I was getting freaked out with his behavior. I freed my hand from his grip and stepped away from him. Hiroshi said in a shaken voice, We should get going. Come on, Jack. With mixed feelings, I started to walk with Hiroshi. The house was going away from our sight, but the old man kept standing there, 
while muttering the same words. I turned back to my friend and asked, What was he saying? Who is that guy? Hiroshi took a pause and said, He is the oldest man in our village. We address him as Pa. People say he has the ability to see the future and predict bad times. I said with surprised eyes, What did he say in Japanese? Hiroshi took a pause and said, His words translate, Beware of Kuchisakiona. I obviously had no idea what this term Kuchisakiona meant, so I kept staring at Hiroshi with curious eyes. Hiroshi said, In Japanese folklore, we have an urban legend named Kuchisakiona, the slit-mouthed woman. According to legend, Kuchisakiona was the unfaithful wife or concubine of a samurai. As punishment for her infidelity, her husband sliced the corners of her mouth from ear to ear. Other versions of the tale include that her mouth was mutilated during a medical or dental procedure, that she was mutilated by a woman who was jealous of her beauty, or that her mouth is filled with numerous sharp teeth. After her death, the woman returned as a vengeful spirit. She covers her mouth with a cloth mask, or in some iterations, a hand fan or handkerchief. She also carries a sharp instrument with her, which has been described as a knife, machete, or a large pair of scissors. Kuchisakiona sneaks up on her victims in the dark and asks them if they think she is beautiful. If the victim answers yes, she pulls off her mask and reveals a red, blood-dripping, grotesque mouth. Then she asks, in a grisly voice, if they still think she is beautiful, adding, even now. If her victim answers no or screams in terror, she slashes them from ear to ear in an imitation of her own mutilation. If they lie and answer yes a second time, she walks away only to follow her target home and slaughter him brutally that night. I won't lie, but this horrible story actually gave me goosebumps. I noticed we have reached the forest, Hiroshi said. Let's go. We have an hour before dawn. We must stick together or else we can get lost. I have never seen such a silent forest. I mean, every place has its own kind of sound, but this forest made me feel like I have to step into a completely different world where no living creature is allowed to enter. Suddenly, a question came to mind. I asked Hiroshi, but why did your pa say that we have to be aware of this slit-mouthed woman? This is just a scary story, right? Hiroshi looked around the dark forest and replied, I don't know why pa reacted this way. I noticed tension on his face as if he is not telling me something. We walked around the forest for a few more minutes and then decided to take a break before leaving for home. We sat on a big rock under a nearby tree. I drank water from the flask and said, So, how can someone save themselves from this urban legend of yours? Hiroshi smiled and said, <laughs> Are you scared, Jack? I replied awkwardly, No way. I'm just asking you to complete the story, that's all. Hiroshi lit up a cigarette and said, An individual can survive an encounter with Kuchisakiona by using one of several methods. In some versions of the legend, Kuchisakiona will leave the potential victim alone if they answer yes to both of her questions. Though in other versions, she will visit the individual's residence later that night and murder the person while sleeping. Other survival tactics include replying to Kuchisakiona's question by describing her appearance as average, giving the individual enough time to run away. As soon as Hiroshi finished his last sentence, something unexpected happened. We were sitting facing a bush nearby. Beside that bush, the forest was even denser. Suddenly, I saw the bush moving. A rustling sound of leaves took place. We both sat silently, staring at the bush. I looked at Hiroshi and saw his freaked out face. The cigarette in his hand has dropped on the ground. I asked in a fearful voice, who, who is that? Just when we noticed something and all the blood in our veins turned cold. As the bushes moved, a head started to appear behind that. A woman slowly stood up from those bushes. Her eyes looked lifeless, and the strange thing was her mask. For a moment, I thought, a pandemic is going around. Maybe that's why she is wearing a mask. But then she came to us and asked, am I beautiful? My head started to throb in fear. I don't know what to say. Hiroshi grabbed my hand and said, run. We started to run without seeing where we were going. Chilling laughter came out of that woman's mouth. As I turned back, 
I saw her. Yes, I saw her. It was her. Her mouth was slashed from ear to ear. Sharp teeth made her laughing terrifying. Somehow, we managed to come out of the forest, and finally, we reached the village, where we were out of breath. We sat on the village ground and started to gasp for air. A few local people came and took us home, thinking we were feeling sick. The next morning, I woke up with a high fever. Hiroshi was sick to his stomach for three days. I still don't know if what we saw was real or our imagination. Later, we asked Hiroshi's pa, and he said the suicide forest is filled with many yirei, that is, ruined or departed spirits. And that was indeed some malevolent spirit who tried to frighten us by taking the shape of this Japanese legend, Kuchisakiona. We never went back to that forest as long as I stayed with them. But what do you think? Did we really see Kuchisakiona in the suicide forest? Or was it something else? I am still in shock after this incident, but I feel that sharing this incident is important. I am Molly. I live in a small town in West Virginia. Our town people are often nice to each other and there's hardly any disturbance here. I often go out with my friends after school. Being a high school teenager is tough, especially when you are looking for adventures, which are hardly possible in our boring town. Our school is located near the woods. One day after school, my friend Joe and I were sitting at the school ground. Suddenly, Joe pointed at the woods and said, Look, isn't that Tim? I followed his eyes and saw my friend Tim coming out of the woods and walking towards us. I was a bit surprised to see him going in there. As he came close to us, I saw his eyes were red and realized he is high. I asked him, What are you doing there? Tim replied in an eccentric tone, Having fun? Then started to <laughs> laugh. Joe asked him, What did you have, dude? Tim smiled and showed us some pills in a small plastic pouch and said, I just met a guy last night. He is selling some really good stash, you know. I went to get some more from him today. This wasn't a very alarming thing to react to because... I have also smoked pot with my friends, but I was worried about Tim seeing this complete stranger in secluded spots to buy drugs, which isn't safe at all. I said in a worried voice, do you know this guy? Isn't it a bit unsafe to meet him at secluded spots? Tim made fun of me and said, well, people can't buy drugs from a local shop, Wanda. And Tim and Joe started laughing at me. They have been good friends, so I didn't mind their little jokes. We all headed home and the day went like usual. I was sitting in my room trying to study when I received a text from Joe. The text reads, Tomorrow, barbecue dinner at my house. Already told Tim, see you tomorrow. As I already said, we live in the same town and our houses were near to each other, so our family was close enough. I told my mom about the dinner invitation to Joe's house and she agreed. Tomorrow was Saturday, so I was excited to have some fun with my friends. The next day, I got ready and went to Joe's house with a homemade pie made by my mom to offer them as a gift. Joe's family arranged a barbecue in their backyard. We three sat down on the corner and started eating roasted meat. Joe's parents were busy on their own, so it was just the three of us chilling out in the backyard under a sky full of stars. We were talking about school gossip and stuff when Tim said, I'm going to meet that man again tomorrow night. He said he has got some really good stuff. Joe said, Dude. Meeting a drug dealer in the woods? That too at night? That's risky. Tim replied in a careless tone. No, this time he asked me to meet him under the Colchester overpass around 7.30 p.m. Joe and I looked at each other with a pale face. Joe said in a highly surprising voice, Wait, do you mean you are going to wait alone at night under the Bunny Man Bridge? <laughs> Tim started laughing in a mocking way and said, Oh God, please don't be so dumb. The Bunny Man is just a made-up story to scare kids. The Bunny Man is an urban legend that originated from two incidents in Fairfax County, Virginia in 1970, but it has been spread throughout the Washington, D.C. area. The legend has many variations. Most of them involve a man wearing a rabbit costume who attacks people with an axe or a hatchet and stabs them to death. Most of the stories occur around the Colchester Overpass, a southern railway overpass which unfortunately lies in our town. Every little kid and adult of this town is aware of this legend. Some people say that the bunny man who was actually a serial killer had died long back, but his spirit still haunts the tunnel 
under the Colchester overpass. I got a bit spooked out by all this conversation, hence I got up to go inside. Guys, let's go inside. Also, it's really dark out here, I said in a feeble voice. Or what? The bunny man will come and stab us? Come on, Molly. Tim mocked me and started <laughs> to laugh. I kind of lost it this time and said, Listen, you dumbass. I too agree with Joe. It's not at all safe meeting a drug dealer under that bridge. You want to be the bravest one? Be it. But you are the stupidest one too. Tim got really angry and said, Yeah, I'm not a coward like you. Now this really got me mad, so I said, Fine. You think only you can handle thrill and danger? I will go with you too. Joe said in a fumbling voice, Guys, I don't think that's a good idea. Tim, why can't you just tell this man to meet you somewhere else? But we were already past the point of discussion, so I said, We two are going with Tim, and that's final. We ate dinner at Joe's house and returned home. Joe and I decided to meet Tim the next day around 7 p.m. I didn't tell my parents about this entire episode because I knew they would be really angry if they knew we are going to the Bunny Man Bridge. I took my flashlight, and for safety purposes, I took my father's hunting knife with me. I just wanted to be ready for any danger. I met Joe and Tim on the way, and we all started walking towards the Bunny Man Bridge. Even in the daylight, people hardly go there. The street leading to our destination was completely empty and surrounded by dark woods. We were almost there. I could see the scary dark tunnel under the bridge at the end of the road. Tim looked at me and said in a funny voice, Feeling scared, Molly? I said in an irritated voice, Get your things quickly and let's just get this over with. Tim called that man and said, Hey, we have reached. Where are you? I don't know what the man said from the other side of the phone, but Tim told us that he is on his way and we have to wait for a minute or two. We walked towards the tunnel and stood there. The bridge was over our head and the tunnel was really dark. There was no sound except the sound of wind and crickets chirping all around. We stood like that for a few minutes, but the man was nowhere to be found. Joe said in a pissed off tone, Where is your guy, Tim? Call him and tell him to come soon. We can't wait here all night, Tim said in a worried voice. You two wait here. I will go and check the road. Joe and I stood there like before, and Tim went the way from where we came. After five more minutes like this, Tim came back and said, The man is still on his way. Joe said in a loud voice, Fuck you, Tim, and your stash guy. Let's go, Molly. There's no point in waiting here. This place is freaking me out. I was fucking annoyed, too, with Tim's jokes. I said, what a waste of time. As we were about to get out of the tunnel, a terrifying scene took place. A man dressed in a bunny costume came out from the bushes at the side of the tunnel and blocked our way. He was standing at five, six hands distance from us. A spine-chilling sensation made my heart skip to my throat. Joe started to breathe heavily. He said in a panicked voice, is this real? This can't be. There's no such thing as ghosts. I had no idea what to do. We couldn't come out of the tunnel without facing him. Tim started to scream too. Suddenly, the bunny man lifted his right arm and I saw a sharp axe-like weapon in his hand. He made a squeaking sound as if our fear was entertaining to him. I was scared and sweating like a horse just when I remembered I have my father's knife with me. I took out the knife as quietly as possible and muttered to myself, if you are a creepy guy in a bunny costume, then you are not getting out of this tunnel alive either. The man then started to sprint towards Joe, and Joe screamed out of shock and fear. As soon as he jumped on my friend with his weapon, I grabbed him from behind and started to stab him with my knife. With the first strike, the bunny man screamed in pain. I could feel his blood on my hands and knew I have stabbed him real deep. This is where the ultimate horror took place. Tim ran to me like a maniac and said, Oh my God, no, stop, Molly, stop. He freed the bunny man from my grasp and pushed me away. The bunny man fell on the road and started to moan and grunt in terrible pain. Tim took his bunny head off and Joe and I were stunned in shock. It was a guy from our school. His name was Charlie. I cried out loud. Charlie, what the hell are you doing here at this time? But Charlie started to pass out in pain. Without any more delay, we rushed him to the hospital. Our parents came, and so did Charlie's parents. We were all punished and scolded heavily, especially Tim. Tim told Charlie to dress up in a bunny costume and wait in the bushes around Colchester Overpass. 
Tim wanted to scare us by using Charlie so that we don't suspect his fake prank and end up believing that the bunny man ghost still exists there. Charlie got 12 stitches on his stomach, but somehow he got saved. We were grounded for a month, and Tim's parents sent him to a boarding school. A little prank ruined all our lives. I will never be able to get out of this trauma that I stabbed an innocent person out of a feat of shock. This happened 19 years ago, and it sure as hell was the most frightening and tragic event that has and will certainly continue to mark me till the rest of my days. I just want to preface this by also telling you that if you're easily disturbed, this story isn't for you. But anyway, on with the story. It was the evening of January the 13th, 2001, and I was at a ski colony with two of my good childhood friends, Josh and Mark. In the colony, we were roughly about 40 kids, ranging anywhere from 8 to 16 years old, and we stayed in a giant hotel for about two weeks. Josh, Mark, and I were all 14 years old, and this was our first time ever on a ski colony together. We were all more or less troublemakers and liked to get into dangerous situations, but what I'm about to tell you was a consequence of us going too far. It was the second week of the trip, and skiing the same slopes got a little repetitive. We were getting bored of skiing at the ski park as well, so we decided to do some off-slope exploring. Meaning, instead of skiing on the slopes, we go off to the side and into the forest while still keeping sight of the skiing tracks. One day, we were with our assigned group, which consists of about 8 kids. We were skiing at the very top area of the mountain, and that's when we decided to go off track. We had ventured our way down, and Mark said he would keep an eye on the track next to us. We all ski extremely fast, and for some reason, Mark wanted to compete on who could be the fastest without hitting any trees. I accepted, and all three of us went down even faster this time. It was now getting even steeper, and I was a little ahead than the two of them. That's when we all rapidly approached some sort of cliff that I had fallen down from. I assumed none of us saw it, because we all sort of made the jump. As soon as I hit the floor though, I stopped and looked behind me to see if everyone landed safely, because it wasn't a small jump to make. I saw Josh land right next to me, and he was fine, but Mark landed pretty harshly and sort of lost balance. Josh and I go up to him to check if he's okay, and that's when we realized we lost the track. Josh proposed the idea that we go back up, but it was impossible. It was too steep, and anyone who skis knows it takes significant time and effort to walk up a steep mountain in the snow while carrying skis. And besides, the cliff behind us was too tall to climb. We decide to just keep going down, and while we were doing so, turn to the right side. We go down slowly this time and keep turning to the right, but unfortunately, there's just more of the same forested area. We figure out it's hopeless and stop a second time to make out a plan. Mark loses all hope and we all more or less tell him that it's okay, but it was now slowly getting dark and kind of came to the terrifying conclusion that we were lost. At this point, we spent a good hour sitting down and talking and it was seriously getting cold for all of us. We all make up our minds to just keep sliding down because it would at some point lead us to civilization. And besides, we had no choice but to go down. As we slide down, it's getting increasingly darker to the point where we barely make out what's in front of us. That's when Josh spots out a light in the far distance to the left. As we get closer to it, we realize it's a small, sketchy-looking wooden cabin. We knock on the front door, and as soon as we do, we hear a woman screaming from inside. What the hell? We all look at each other in shock. After a couple of seconds, we hear a loud bang, and the screaming abruptly stops. Mark backs off and tells us, Maybe this isn't a good idea. To be honest, we were all freaked out and kind of startled backing away from the door. As soon as we did though, we heard a male voice cussing very loudly. Then, about 20 seconds after, someone opened the door. 
At this point, we were about 15 feet away from the door, and sprinting towards us were two enraged Rottweiler dogs. We immediately started running away. The dogs eventually caught up to Mark and Josh, while I somehow made it behind a bush, a little far off into the forest. I waited there for about five minutes, trying to catch my breath. All of a sudden, I noticed some light coming from about 100 feet in the clearing. I peeked up and saw the man walking towards me, seemingly following my footsteps. I decide there's no other way for me not to get killed besides quietly walking around the forest in a circle and slowly make my way back to the house. So I quietly shifted back to the side of the bush from where he couldn't see me. I somehow make it inside the house and immediately try to find a phone. Luckily, I find a phone on the kitchen counter and call the cops. I briefly tell them I'm in grave danger and that they should track the location of the phone I'm calling from. I then proceed to go upstairs to find somewhere to hide. I notice there's an attic ladder brought down, so I climb up. As soon as I do, I get hit with a strong smell, like something rotting. For some reason, the light is on, and I look around for a good hiding spot. That's when in the far corner of the attic, I first notice a group of flies lying around. Then I see it. It was a dead corpse. It appeared to be a woman with her face brutally beat up. Before I have any time to process, I suddenly hear the front door close shut. I quickly hide behind a shelf and hear the guy yelling something along the lines of, I know where you're hiding, you sneaky f I then notice there's a window right behind me. Fortunately, it was a window built in the slanted roof, meaning I could make it on the top of the roof. I open it, push off the snow, and somehow shove myself through and make it onto the roof, closing the window in the process. A couple of minutes later, I hear the shelf underneath me crash down and the guy cussing. I also hear a helicopter coming from a distance. As soon as I sigh in relief though, I suddenly see the window opening. That's when I remembered I must have put some snow on the attic floor by climbing onto the roof. I quickly keep it shut by standing on it. The lights of the helicopter shine on me, and I see it's now directly above me, with the rope being thrown down. I grab the rope, and right as I do, some object hits my feet, shattering the glass of the window. This guy broke the window. He tries grabbing for my feet, but I'm just out of reach as I climb up the rope and the helicopter goes back up. I don't want to bore you too much with the details of the aftermath, but Josh was severely bruised, but managed to kill the dog he was fighting with. But Mark unfortunately ended up being paraplegic from the dog chewing his legs while he was knocked unconscious from hitting his head on a tree. The guy trying to kill us allegedly killed his own wife and had a life sentence to prison. We never made it back to see anyone from that colony though we damn well learned to follow the most simple rules from that day on. That was three unsettling horror stories animated by IMR Entertainment. Scary Stories Entertainment. All right, we're going to do the dead spread right now. I'm a little late at shuffling. Alright, let's see what's going on with our deceased loved one. The person I'm connecting with here was very indecisive. It had, or has, it's like their head was spinning, right? They never knew where to go. And they're still that way. I mean, they're a little bit more clear now, but still they're like, do I go left? Do I go right? What do I do? 
Now, um, looking back on their life, they realized that they were very cynical, or they were dealing with um, a very cynical water sign. The lesson I'd like to share is that they wish they had paid attention more to their intuition, and they want you to know to pay more attention to your intuition, because there are secrets around, and they've been trying to tell you stuff, but... You know, for some reason it hasn't been getting through. Um, but something they wish they paid more attention to was possibly this Gemini, their lover. I, I get the feeling that they they didn't get to do quite the stuff that they wanted to do with you or their partner. Or vice versa, you feeling that way about them message that they would like to give you is you know don't don't be selfish with your energy all right or possessive or hoard too much okay because if you hoard too much you'll feel overwhelmed and then i don't know hoarding is is like a, a form of mental illness right you have too much stuff and then you're afraid of change and releasing and they don't want you to have to go through that they've seen too many people go through that before they want you to give more of yourself all right i hope that this helps i love you all thank you so much for listening to me my name is libra empress please don't forget to hit like subscribe and share and i will see you for next week's tarot and tarot with me libra empress Bye, my beautiful, beautiful friends. Stay safe.